While NATO may be a few short steps away from a war with Russia, it certainly seems like that's what they want. Overnight, Russian President Putin asked Joe Biden to stop sending weapons to Ukraine. Putin also announced that Russia has the right to start supplying weapons to other countries and regions where the attacks will be carried out on sensitive targets in countries like Ukraine, uh, countries where the U.S. may have illegal bases, perhaps Syria comes to mind. Is this a descent into full-on war, or is it a possibility of nuclear war? Well, our next guest says that if Russia is attacked, they will respond with a massively destructive attack on Kiev, and he lines out the sequence of events. Uh, Gilbert Doctorow is the author of many books on Russia-U.S. relations, has been warning about this for decades. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for the, for the invitation. So you, in your most recent Substack, you lay out what you think will be Russia's response, and it goes something like this, Kiev, Poland, then military factories and bases in German, Germany, the UK, and France. And then in the end, spoiler alert, you say, but the US will not come to their aid and honor its Article 5 obligation under the NATO treaty. So the US then is sort of escalating with no intent to actually show up, which is so interesting. Can you talk to, talk to this? Yes, um, the last week or so, there's been a lot of discussion abroad in the United States and Europe about, and also within Russia, about what the likely response of Russia will be to strikes in its heartland and to military and civilian uh, critical infrastructure by missiles that were manufactured in the United States, the Atakams, by, by, by France, Scalpers, and by uh, the United Kingdom uh, in its storm shadow and given to Ukraine with the decision a week ago to announce that the Ukrainians have free hands to do what they like with these weapons and to decide what to target and what to strike. Uh, the Russian president, uh, in a little over a week ago during a press conference at Tashkent airport, which he was at the end of his visit, a three-day visit to Uzbekistan, mentioned that from the Russian perspective, any strike on Russia coming from Ukraine and using missiles of this nature, long range missiles delivered from the West, is effectively an attack on Russia by the manufacturers and those guiding those missiles in the West. And that the Ukrainian finger on the button to launch was nothing more than a finger on a button. The decision making on what to target and the, uh, the um, preparation of those missiles it's essential to their success. That is the targeting information coming comes from reconnaissance uh, satellites, uh, monitoring the Russian ground, and is a, some a technology that is inaccessible to Ukrainians. So effectively, the the Western countries would be using Ukraine simply as a cat's finger, a cat's paw, to do what they want to do themselves and don't have the courage to say they're doing. Uh, the response, what Russia will do in that eventuality, has been the subject of a lot of speculation everywhere, as I say. Within Russia, the talk shows, uh, which some very responsible and well-known personalities appear, I mean, by personalities, I mean uh, experts uh, who are members of the Duma and who do have decision-making responsibility or uh, in the country, they have come out and they've made their remarks. And I will summarize that in a moment. But the point is that there's a lot of um, pressure on President Putin to be more explicit. What does he mean by response? Um, and what, who will be targeted? The, the reason why he's coming under this pressure is the realization by Russian uh, officials that um, that the warnings from Russia of what it may or may not do in response to this or that when its red lines are crossed have been misconstrued as bluffing in the West. That Russia has let, has let uh, the United States and other uh, NATO allies cross various um, red lines without paying a price. So why should Russia exhort a, uh, demand a price now? And there has been, going back six months ago or more, 
um, some political scientists who have great renown within Russia and also are quite well known abroad, like Karaganov, were saying that to be credible Russia, uh, in its threats to respond, Russia should do something demonstrative that catches everyone's attention and leaves no possibility for misunderstanding its determination to defend its sovereignty. What Karaganov was recommending and which created an outrage uh, in Washington, D.C., and also even among some of his fellow um, politicians and, and experts in Russia, he was saying, let's use technical nuclear weapons and make a strike and, and demonstrate that we have the power and are ready to use the power to defend ourselves. Well, that fell by the wayside. But in the, in the last few days, the other Russians who were quite responsible and uh, Dmitry Tranian, for example, who was always a voice of reason, have come out also um, pressuring the, the Kremlin to be more decisive and to be more explicit about its intentions. The, um, on Russian talk shows, the, the suggestion was made a week ago that they should, Russia should strike uh, the, the uh, airport in Poland, that is the main um, re receiving point and distribution point for incoming U.S. and other allied weapons going to Ukraine. Is it a civilian, been... a civilian airport? Or is it a military No, it's a, it's, a, it's a military airport. Okay. Uh, but nonetheless, it is a NATO country. Yes. And there is, of course, the possibility that Article 5 would be triggered. In any case, the Russians were saying it's time to do something and not just to talk. Mr. Putin yesterday, in a uh, widely uh, discussed um, meeting with journalists from around the world uh, at the opening of the, or preliminary to the opening of the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, uh, said that he would respond in an ace or that the Russians would respond in an asymmetric fashion, as you as you announced. Mm -hmm. What exactly that means is very hard to fathom. You've, you've mentioned uh, Syria, that's possible. Um, of course, there are other countries that have grievances and also delivery possibilities like the Houthis in Yemen, who could profit from Russian weapons to inflict considerable damage on U.S. bases in the region. Um, that is one way that it can go. Um, however, I think there are other possibilities. And um, that's such the, uh, the, but the biggest issue that I want to bring to the attention of this audience is that um, certain well-known experts and commentators in the United States have drawn the conclusion that a, if the NATO strikes on, on Russian heartland will result, result almost automatically in a um, massive exchange of nuclear uh, attacks between the United States yes. and, and Russia. Right. That's to say that we will go straight <laughs> to, to, um, to all-out nuclear war and to the end of civilization. There are people like Ted Postel, who is an, a major expert from MIT, who've spoken about uh, these risks. Larry Johnson, who is well known to your audience, yes. uh, appeared on Sonar and said to, yes, either last night or this morning uh, that, uh, that we have faced this risk of, of nuclear war. Um, and Scott Ritter was yesterday on, uh, on Judge Napolitano's program, Judging Freedom, and we're saying precisely that. And it's these, these particular remarks that prompted me to re-examine the question, are we on the cusp of the end of civilization a nuclear war, or is there something more gradual that could be stopped along the way and that is a more likely a scenario? And my basis for saying the latter is that Mr. Putin is not a gambling man. I have written last week that Russia has first strike capability, which is largely ignored in the United States and Western Europe. Um, 10 years ago, when the Russians first spoke of developing a new, a new advanced uh, range of strategic weapons, uh, people whom I met in the West all were saying this was a bluff, that the Russians are incapable of doing anything as, that would, that would uh, supersede, that would, be, that would be more advanced than what 
of the United States can do with its vast military budget that's greater than all the military budgets of the rest of the world combined. This was inconceivable with the Russians with 10 times less money and with a, in a country which had lost some of its best brains to Silicon Valley in the 1990s. How could they possibly uh, carry this out? Well, they did. And um, we know that from the, from the new modernized triad that Mr. Po Mr. Putin spoke about three years ago and which has been rolled out and, and put into the field um, in the last year or so. So the Russians have proven that they are very capable. And they, but what that means by capable, I was saying, they are first strike capable. They could wipe out at a go almost, almost, almost all of the United States' um, uh, nuclear force and swept away a large part of, of, of the map in the in continental United States. Now, I say a large part, I didn't say all. And uh, the same is true for the United States. The United States on a first strike could, could eliminate a very large part of Russia's land base, particularly I stress land based, because this is mutually the same. What the Russians would not, would not uh, remove from the states would be the nuclear submarines and so on. So both sides have the possibility of, of, a, of a first strike that would be devastating, but would not uh, eliminate the possibility of some kind of retaliation that could cost tens or 20 million lives on their country. So Mr. Putin is not a gambling man. So what well, would he do? Can I ask you about, about that then? Because what you're saying is that he is facing criticisms for bluffing from even his mm -hmm. own allies. But if we look at it from the other side, does it then seem like the United States is also bluffing, but sort of acti asking its friends to escalate, meaning European countries, on its behalf with no intention of standing behind them? Yes, but I wouldn't use the word bluffing. Okay. Because I don't think anybody in Washington will admit what we're talking about. That when push comes to shove, the United States has no, war, no problems with, with uh, Kiev being taken off the face of the earth. By the right. Russians. What you say here, yeah. actually, I want to highlight this so that our readers see it for themselves and seek it out, is that this will not lead to nuclear war because Europe and the U.S. do not give a damn about Ukrainian lives. So the cost of a Russian strike would be nil. So please continue. I'm sorry I interrupted you with your own words. Well, that is with respect to Kiev. But where I'm going uh, beyond that uh, and into rather, rather um, uh, dangerous territory uh, for, for uh, the audience's understanding of who we are and who they are, is to say that the United States doesn't give a damn about Europe. This is not a bluff. It's simply, and that, as I am finding, as I look around and attend some high-level uh, luncheons, uh, by by uh, by uh, Belgian elites who are meeting with Belgian military personnel and uh, military personnel who are saying that they no longer believe in what was the third strike or the third uh, element of the nation's defense that the cavalry would come to its aid, the cavalry being the United States. They no longer believe that. And um, so this is the area where we are today, that um, I'm saying that Europeans don't give a damn about Kiev, that Europeans don't give a damn about Poland because Poland is on the line. I don't think anybody in Belgium or Germany will lift a finger if the Russians strike, uh, strike against Poland. Article five or no Article five. Article five does not require member states to take a specific action. It is a, it is a format for them to take that action, but nobody is going to impose a penalty on those who don't. So these countries will not defend one another and the United States will not defend Europe. I cannot imagine Mr. Biden or anybody else in power in the White House sacrificing New York, Los Angeles, Miami to say to as a retaliation against the loss of London. Right. Yeah. Well, this is something that you lay out quite expertly and uh, 
interestingly enough, you're predicting that this will not lead to nuclear war, but your your newsletter is called Armageddon Newsletter. Uh, I highly suggest that our readers subscribe to it because um, you're a voice of reason in foreign policy. And again, you've been warning about this conflict for decades. It's not in vogue for you. It's something you've watched for a long time. So thank you for your time and for coming back on Redacted. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, thanks again for the invitation.